to the wrong address? Are you shipping things to an address that should have been an inactive record within your system? It's a duplicate of something else that you've been working on and it's become stale. Um, are things being delayed? Because you have to stop and figure out, okay, which one is the correct one? Um, are, and that could have a negative effect on your cash flow. And are your users tied up digging through, uh, you know, somebody calls, you know, um, Tom Watson calls from IBM, and you're trying to figure out, is, is it this IBM account, or is it the International Business Machines Corporation? Is it this Tom Watson record, or is the in there is Thomas Watson Sr.? You know, which record, how much time are users spending trying to figure out what's the right record for them to be entering in more current information for? So there's things there as far as uh, productivity. You know how much it costs for a person in your organization, and you can do some rough calculations as to how much time they're wasting doing things. And you're probably hearing about it as well. And then there's some sort, some more soft costs. It's a little harder to do a, a strict ROI analysis on, but the you can probably get an evaluation of what these costs might mean to your organization. Sometimes it's a lot harder to calculate. But inaccurate reporting. How much of your sales is coming from your top 100 customers? Well, if your top 100 customers may be split between three, one organization has been there three times, they may not even show up in the top 100 because of the way that they're split. They may be 105, 115, and 253, but if you aggregate that all up, it becomes a top 100 customer. Are you treating them appropriately uh, in that sense? Um, if you aren't uh, doing a good job of tracking information accurately, are you doing an adequate job of cross-selling, uh, if that's an opportunity that you may have? And every business is different, and there is no, there's no um, pure calculation for ROI on evaluating what to do about your problem with duplicate or dirty data. And so I'm just throwing these out. Everybody might hit on one or two all things, but just throwing these things out as, as suggestions. Employee confidence, getting back to the productivity side of things, are your people confident about the quality of the data? Are they frustrated? Um, these are things that you know everybody struggles with user acceptance in a deployment of a new um, CRM system or any system, CRM, ERP, anything, where you're trying to get a better handle on um, the information that you have within your organization. If your employees aren't confident about it, maybe they're not using it to its full capacity. Maybe they're still keeping those Excel spreadsheets or side notes on things rather than entering them into the system where you can get it a big picture. Um, if you're using BI tools, and I know Technology Advisors has a, a, a practice that they work with a lot of the clients on business intelligence tools that they can utilize, well, those BI results are only as good as the data that you have within the system. And so that's also, uh, an, it can cause an adverse effect on, on what kind of management reports or information that's in the management reports uh, is generated. And then customer perception satisfaction. How embarrassing is it to be prospecting an existing customer? You know, sometimes that's the breaking point for some organizations. We've got to get this cleaned up because every customer of ours is worth an average of you know six thousand dollars in bottom line per year. I was just throwing a number out there. It could be higher, it could be lower, but there's a value to an existing customer that you have. How much damage does it do to send out a prospecting mailing, treating an existing long-term customer like there's somebody? right off the street. So things like that are things to, to take into consideration. So what to do about it? Every organization should have some sort of a data quality strategy. And there needs to be the proper executive level and, and line levels within the disciplines within the organization, whether it be sales and marketing and operations, and uh, whatever disciplines make sense for your organization to have people accountable for the quality of the data. It's a top-down and it's a bottom-up type of a strategy that should be in place. There should be different people within different points in the organization that are responsible at their level for maintaining the quality of the data. And a lot of times, if, if you present it as a bottom-up, what is it that we can help you to do to make sure that your users aren't spending too much time looking for things, that they do have a high level of confidence in, in the uh, the quality of the data within the system, that their job is being optimized. They don't, users don't like wasting time in, in most cases. They want to get their job done. They want to be efficient and effective. So you need to define standards and, you know, for um, all forms.
forms of data capture, whether it be data entry or lists that you purchase or imports or web leads that come in. Data gets into these systems in a lot of different ways. Based on the way that you use your data, define some um, appropriate standards for um, what constitutes a valid record um, or what constitutes a duplicate record. Some organizations that we help them clean up their data, they have duplicates and they have duplicates on purpose. They may have different lines of business that are selling to the same customers. They may have different uh, uh, territory reps for these different lines that are selling to the same customers, but those customers are set up separately within their ERP system, so the CRM system has to mirror that. There may be you no know, direct links between them. So every organization is a little different in how they organize this, but your data quality strategy should be recognizing those aspects of your data collection processes. And it's not just a let's get this all cleaned up and then we're golden. Because unfortunately, there's humans that are interacting with the data on a daily basis. And again, that means that strategy has to be in place from a user perspective as well as a systematic perspective to make sure that, that the things that your users are doing on an ongoing basis are appropriate for maintaining the quality of your data on an ongoing basis. So again, then I get down to the bottom to what happens with dead context. That's more, more um, a tactical aspect of it. But the defining the processes and the uses of tools, uh, what tools do you use them? Where are they used? How often are they used? This is an ongoing process. Um, it may be a massive cleanup effort at the beginning, and then it may be periodic things over days, over weeks, every quarter, every year. Every time you import a list, you know there may be some discrete uh, activities that you need to uh, focus on for additional data cleansing processes. But again, every organization is different, and, and the folks at Technology Advisors can help you to help define what these strategies are. They've got a lot of experience with this, um, and, and they lean on us when they need to lean on us to help them with, with things that are specific to tools that we have that are available. So. Um, I think there's another poll question popping up here. Um, basically, do you already have a strategy in place um, for data quality? So I think uh, technology advisors are trying to understand, uh, at least within this audience, where things are within the audience as far as um, some of these uh, questions. So I appreciate your, your answers to the poll questions. But I, again, I'm going to carry on. Um, here to respond. There we go. So now obviously we've got some tools. The reason that I'm here is because we have some tools that can help you in implementing the strategy. And there are other tools. I'll, I'll, you know, I don't just want to turn this into a sales pitch. Uh, we have some tools that we're going to talk about today, but there are also some other tools that I'm not going to talk about today. And the folks at Technology Advisors can, can help with that as well. Things like address standardization and verification tools. Um, we have the ability within our Power Entry product to integrate those into the data entry process. In this case, I'm showing Power Entry for Sales Logics. Um, Power Entry is an implementation of some matching technology that we've developed that allows for not only the streamlining of data entry into Sales Logics, but also improved searching capabilities. Being able to help your users find those records that they're looking for, if they are conscientious and actually look before they enter in information, Power Entry is a product that, that can help with that. It can also be a proactive duplicate avoidance front end for data entry into sales logics. And as I said, we can integrate other, other things that, that fit into the um, strategy and tactics of improving the quality of the data that you have within the system. So let's, uh, let me switch over and actually get into sales logics, and I'll, I'll talk about this from a more um, user-oriented perspective here. Um, as I said, Power Entry does a couple of different things. And Power Entry, just a little bit of background, Power Entry has been around for about 11 years now, I believe, within the Sales Logics world. Started with Sales Logics version 3. And it was developed by Qdata over in the UK because they had Sales Logics users that were having these issues of not being able to find what they're looking for and also duplicates getting into the system causing problems. And so this is a, a very proactive uh, approach to avoiding duplicates at the point of data entry. So what does it look like? In sales logics, um, you have the ability at the account level, you can do a lookup on accounts through starting with or contains or equal to or you know, the standard.
standard Boolean um, uh, matching uh, capabilities there. There's a lot of different ways to get to that. You can do it in a lot of ways there. You, there's also a lookup menu. You've got lookups for the contact where the last name starts with or begins or, or, or contains or that type of thing. But if I were, let's say I wanted to look up an account called JAE. I've got an account in the system called JAE, so I type in JAE to do a search, and I don't have any accounts in here. So then, even though I went to look as a user, I might go and enter that in as a new account in the system. Okay, so that's the the capabilities of the standard look up there. And I may look at, yeah, I may have to look at it three or four or five different ways to find it. If I really know, I know there's somebody in there called JAE, but I don't remember how they're entered. Okay, well. With Power Entry, part of what we add in is something called IntelliSearch that uses some underlying, very in intelligent, comprehensive matching algorithms that allow for us to find things based on different types of logic. So if I choose to search using IntelliSearch instead of the standard out-of-the-box sales logic searching functionality, and I type in the same thing, J-A-E, and hit Enter, I find that it's actually seven accounts in my system that look like JAE. I've got J period, A period, E period, all the way to the Jupiter Astronomy Equipment Corporation. Okay, and in some cases they're you know typical things. In some cases they're spelled terribly, uh, different abbreviations, those types of things. And and the IntelliSearch capabilities can be used if you've got a very large database. You can use other things, uh, geographic things, to to um, narrow it down. If I just I know I've got a JAE in San Ramon. So I type in San Ramon, and now I get all of the Jupiter Astronomy Equipment Corporation records that are in San Ramon. I can look at some details about them if I wish to. Uh, so there's a summary of details here that you can look at, different contacts that are at that account. That type of thing. I can create a sales logics group from those four if I would need to drill down deeper, but you get the idea. So IntelliSearch allows you to find accounts that you're looking for. Similarly, if I want to look for a contact, I know there, I'm looking for somebody named Bill Hyatt. Well, I don't have anything that's exactly what I put in there, but there's five different contacts within my system that look like Bill Hyatt. And just like IntelliSearch at the account level had the proper algorithms to be able to discern different types of name variations within an organization, there's different rules that apply when we're looking for people. It knows that Bill and Billy and William and William and Will are really all just variations of the same first name. Hyatt phonetically can be spelled all sorts of different ways. So if you look at the variations in these names and the scoring of it, you can see that all of these scored very high. They're up in 98, 99% comparison because of the rules that we applied to them. And again, you can narrow things down. You know, I'm, I'm looking for this guy named Bob at you know, this electronics company. So you can put in account names as well, or Bob in St. Louis, or things like that that allow you to I could type in just Bill in St. Louis, and here I get you know Bill Hyatt or William Hyatt in St. Louis at Amtec and Lehman. Okay, so you get the idea. So these are for your proactive users that are actually trying to do a good job of finding the record that they're looking for before they enter something. IntelliSearch, which is part of Power Entry, can help with that. Now then, there's the other 95% of your users who may not be so conscientious. And they just go ahead and they click on the toolbar to insert a new contact or account, or they go to the insert menu, or they hit the insert key. However, they get to the add new account contact process within Sales Logics. Power Entry um, intercepts that process in this case. They can't do it the way that they've been doing it before because that doesn't provide enough duplicate avoidance protection for you as an organization. So we intercept it and we say, okay, what is, what's the basic information that you're trying to enter in? And I type in Lewis Balbo at Abbott. Maybe I've got Lewis on the phone, and Lewis says, hi, you know, this is Dale at QGate, and Lewis says, hi, this is Lewis Balbo at Abbott. Oh, Lewis, have you ever done any business with us before? No, no, I'm probably not in your system. Okay, let me add you into the system. So I type in just that amount of information, I hit enter. And it says, oh, actually, you've got a couple. I've been playing with this database. So you've got a couple of, of records in here. Yeah, well, Lou Balbo, you know, I, I'm in there, but that's my dad or something like that. I'm at Abbott Worldwide, you know, that type of thing. Well, maybe it's not the same 
you know, maybe it's not me. Now, notice I spelled Abbott, one B, one T, but it found the, I spelled Lewis Balwell completely different. It found those. Maybe it's not. I want to go ahead and add them as new. So I say add as new, and the system stops and says, okay, well, you already have these accounts in the system. You said it wasn't that Lou at that Abbott, but you've got these accounts in the system. Is it one of these accounts? He said, yeah, I am at the Abbott Worldwide account in Chicago. So I select that, and now I'm just entering this new contact at this existing account and not creating a duplicate. Okay. Now, the account information is already there. And, and let me stop at this point and, and talk about this. This screen is built within the SalesLogix architect. So if you're a SalesLogix user currently, and I, I'm not sure who's using what platforms here at, at, at this point, this is a specific SalesLogix um, data entry product, Paribus, which we'll talk about next for batch cleansing is more data agnostic. But power entry for sales logics, um, this screen is built in the architect. So this typically looks different for everybody. This is the base product that comes with power entry. But because it's built in the architect, the team at technology advisors or anybody who's familiar with the sales logics architect can modify this to get rid of things you don't want, to add in things that you require. So if there's certain required fields that you need at the point of data entry, for your particular implementation. These obviously would be your pick lists, those types of things. But in this case, I typed in the name. It brings that over, says, oh, you were trying to enter in Lewis Balbo, so I'll populate that for you. Um, had I entered in any other information, it would have grabbed that. I didn't put any address information, so it pulled in the default address for the account I'm entering this for. Obviously, if I was entering a new contact and a new account, these would be editable fields. But uh, one of the other things that causes problems for a lot of organizations is email addresses. So um, it, here we try to streamline that as well. So typically, now here we already have the domain for the account. So at the point of entering an email address, if I hit one character, like L for Lewis, it will populate the email with first name dot last name at domain.com. So in this case, we know the domain. And this is a real. This is one of my favorite things from our own internal database is that I hate typing in email addresses because if you don't get it just right, it's not going to work. And there's, it's pretty standard how people use email. Now, maybe this organization, they don't use first name, dot, last name at their domain. Maybe it's a first initial last name. So I start with L for Lewis. I type in the D for Balbo, and it goes to lbalbo at abbott.com. So in a lot of cases, when I'm entering an email address, one, two, three characters, I'm done, rather than having to retype the name and maybe their domain is abbott.net, well, that would refer to abbott.net here, and I don't mistakenly type .com just because of the habit, those types of things. Or you can select from the list of standard email address formats. Or if it's not that, you can obviously type over, you know, type in a hotmail or some other format. Maybe it's, it's you know, lewisbal at abbott.com, so you can type over it if you want to. But that's just another streamlining of that entry. We talked about address verification and standardization. We support Satori's Mailroom Toolkit and QAS's Quick Address. And Avalara has a service for lookup of, of um, uh, you type in a, a um, five-digit zip code and it fills in city and state, those types of things. So there's some address verification, standardization, integration built into this. Obviously, you would have to have the subscription from those individual vendors for that to work. But also, this is, the address button is a button. So if there are other addresses at that account already, that could be brought in here. And you can select a different office address. Maybe this Lewis is at a different Abbott address. And it's as easy as a picking from that pick list. So you get the idea. So uh, focusing on, on just what Power Entry is, it's very interactive with users. It's intelligent searching. It's duplicate avoidance at the point of that entry. So again, helping with that strategy of trying to eliminate a lot of the problems that happen uh, by users inadvertently or through laziness, not entering in or not, not finding the records that they're looking for and entering in duplicates at the point of that entry. Power Entry is a great tool for helping them be more productive and avoid these problems. Okay. So back to the, the slideshow here. And switching gears a little bit over to another product called Paribus. And in this case, I'm going to show Paribus for sales logics. Uh, Janet said that a larger percentage of, of the users that were coming in today and registered for the seminar were sales logics, uh, had sales logics implementation. Paribus will also work 
there's a Paribus for Sage CRM, there's a Paribus for Microsoft Dynamics CRM, and Paribus itself is data agnostic. We have people using Paribus with their Oracle data warehouse that has nothing to do with the CRM system. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about the, the, the fact that it's wide open as far as data is concerned. This particular plug-in for SalesLogix is, is specific to SalesLogix. But what is Paribus? Paribus is a tool that, that was actually came from the power entry side of things. We had thousands of users using power entry, and a lot of them came to us and said, hey, this is great. Our users aren't entering in duplicates anymore, but we have this mess that we started with. You know, when we started our sales logic implementation, we had, you know, 15 different ACT databases and 35 Outlook exports, and we had a dump from our, our accounting system, and all of that data got uh, collected and imported into the CRM system, and, and our partner did a good job of trying to find the obvious things that they could find before they put it in there, but there's a lot of things. There's the IBM and the International Business Machines Corporation that just didn't get found. And then we've been using it for the last couple of years, and our users have entered stuff. We've added more lists, and so you get the idea. There's a lot of issues happen within systems, and Paribus was a tool that, that was developed to try and resolve that problem that you have with your system. So we can Paribus can help you identify the problems and clean up your database, and avoid importing duplicates from purchased or imported lists. So Paribus can compare data that's in your system as well as data between your CRM system and an access database, or another SQL Server database, or you can cross-reference the data that's in your CRM system against your accounting system, because it might be as IBM in your CRM system and international business machines in the accounting system, and you want to um, synchronize those through um, through some sort of a Dynalink connection or whatever you might use for, for synchronization. Or you buy another company, and you need to consolidate that information from that company into your CRM system, Paribus can help with that as well. Okay. So what is that? Uh, oh, there's poll question number three. And that is, uh, um, I think it was, uh, do you have any pushback from users or complaints from users within your system about the quality of the data? Okay. Um, I'm not seeing the polls, so I'm not, that's, for some reason that's not showing up on my screen, but that's okay. Um, so if you'd answer poll question number three, whatever that may be, that would be great. And again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to carry on here. So what is Paribus? We talked about it a little bit in general terms. I'll use a little graphics here to, um, to maybe illustrate the point. Paribus, in its simplest sense, allows you to compare any two data sets. We've got data set A and data set B, and I want to, back to high school geometry and Venn diagrams and all of that, I want to find out where there's an overlap between A and B. So to do that, you set up your match rules. I want to compare data set A and data set B. How? Well, typically in a, in a CRM system, you might want to look at account, look for accounts that are duplicated. I want to compare account names. Well, you can compare account names at whatever threshold. And thinking back to those JAE examples, uh, we were looking at account names that were similar. Well, you can compare the account names. But then you also can set up other conditions. So I, I want to say account names that are similar, but only where their addresses are, are also similar. And what Paribus will then do is create groups of potential matches. It will go out, query your data, and collect information about those records so that then you can review what Paribus found. So it'll group things together into groups. So here's some examples of things that would find country corporation and the country corporation, or real estate experts, Inc., and the real estate experts. You get the idea. Okay? But then we can identify through the review of, OK, if these are duplicates, which one should be the primary? So if we're looking within our CRM system looking for duplicates, we can identify which records are duplicates, which groups are duplicates. And there may be more than two in each group. And you'll see that when we, we run through an example in using Paribus. And identify which one should be the primary where we want to push all the data to make a consolidated record. Okay? Identify which one should be the primary, and then run the cleansing. And now the results are now we have fewer accounts in the system because they are consolidated uh, records from the duplicates. So that's from the simplest perspective. That's what Paribus is. Now let's look at it from a uh, what what Paribus looks like as a product. So it's a, a very simple interface, um, but basically you start at the bottom and work your way up to the point of creating match sessions. Now everything that I'm going to show you here in Paribus is pr pretty much out of the box. We 
ship with it preset definitions for sales logic and safe CRM and dynamic CRM so that you don't have to start from scratch. It's an open tool that can look at any data as long as we can make a connection to your database through any standard data link. So it can be an ODBC, an OLEDB, SQL, a native client connection, a Microsoft Jet connection for something like Access. So you just basically have to tell Peribus if I go to this one that I've got set up for my demo data, I told it I'm using a, an OLEDB connection for SQL Server. So I'm making a native connection, not the sales logic provider, just a, a native connection. And it's on this server. Here's my credentials to get data out of that. And here's my demo database. Yes, I've got a good connection to my data. Okay. So this is the basics. I've told Paribus where my data is. And that's the only special thing I needed to do. Then I went ahead and imported all sorts of preset definitions that are related specifically to analyzing and fixing a sales logic database. So in this case, it preloaded all these sales logic account data set definitions and contact data set definitions that point to specific elements of data within my database so that I can match on account names or I can match on address elements. So in this case, this is a concatenation of first line street address, city, zip code, and country. Okay. And I, it applies the appropriate rules, matching algorithms, for that type of data that I'm matching on. So this is kind of the under the hood pieces of Paribus. That in, in a presentation like this, I won't get that deep in, but just to kind of give you an idea. And you can create new data sets to point to an access database or another SQL Server database or an Oracle or a DB2 or whatever, wherever your data is, you can create a data set as long as you can make that connection through a data provider, then point to that data. And there's a wizard that will help you build this. But everything here, I just imported what by you know, click of a mouse point to a file, import this preset set of definitions. All of this then rolls up into a match set. And actually, there, let me step back one step here to um, match sets. A match set is a template based on these building blocks that does a particular thing. This I've got a match set template for account name matches in sales logics and one for contact name matches in sales logics. And so this is a template that I can build multiple sessions from. So to equate this to how what other kinds of electronic templates can be used, every time you send out a fax, you might want to have a cover sheet to the fax. But every time you create a cover sheet, for this is for those people who still send out faxes. I know it's old technology. But for a, a fax cover sheet, you wouldn't want to have to create that every single time. Going find your company logo and draw lines and boxes and cells in a table and, and put in the labels for that. No, you have a Word document template that's a fax cover sheet that you can just say, I'm sending this to Dale at QGate. Here's his fax number. Here's 20 pages. And here's my notes. And that gets printed out, and that goes on the faxes as the cover sheet. Every time you run a match session looking for duplicate accounts, it's probably going to be very similar to the one you ran yesterday, or a month ago, or six months ago. So you set up a template for that, and that's what this preset template is that comes with Paribus. It's an account name template that uses that data set that we were looking at here for account names as my primary comparison. I can set up a default fuzziness threshold how similar or dissimilar am I going to allow um, account names to be to be considered potential duplicates? Do I want to have Paribus automatically identify a primary group member from data set A or data set B? Again, back to the comparing A and B. And then what kinds of other secondary conditions might I want to apply? So what does that mean when we come up and create a match session? So I'm going to go ahead and create a brand new match session. It's going to say, just like if you go File, New in Microsoft Word, what template do you want to use? In this case, I want to create a new match session. What match set template do I want to use? I said I want to do an account name match. OK. So it brings in all of the preset guidelines from my setup for an account name match. I'm going to call this a test account match, uh, 80%. Uh, you can name it whatever you wish. And it says, OK, well, I'm going to do an 80% match on the account name. And then I have the ability to, as I said, apply other conditions. I want account names that are similar, but only where their full address is also similar. And I'm going to you know, bump that up to 
So, and, and these, you can set all of your conditions independent. So I can say, yeah, account names need to be very similar, but wider on the address. Or I don't need, want to look at the whole address, I just want to look at the state being an exact match. Or address is similar, or the phone number is similar. So you can do things like that to find what works for your organization. In this case, I'm going to say account names are 80% similar, and the full address, as we saw before, is first line street address, city, zip code, country, is 82% similar, and automatically identify a primary group member from data set A. Now, in this case, if I don't place a filter on this, A and B are going to be my whole sales logic database. Now, in this demonstration, that's logical. I've got 1,400 or 1,300 records in my sales logic database at the account level. Not very big. If you had 250,000 account records in your database, I would counsel you to put a filter on it. Maybe look at a region at a time so, A, it doesn't take too long to run, and B, you get results that are manageable to review and you then cleanse and then go on and do another batch. So there's, there's ways that you can break, thing down, break things down, and filters are very simple. I could add a filter for Illinois and say the address state is equal to Illinois. And that filter then would say, oh, I only have 53 records in Illinois. So that was how hard it is. You basically have to tell Paris what's your where clause. And you can string things together, multiple conditions, things like that. But basically, now I have an Illinois filter, so I could just look at Illinois if I wanted to by just applying the Illinois filter to both. Now, or I could say I want to look for accounts that have opportunities and compare them against the accounts that don't have opportunities so that I automatically identify the primary, the survivor in the merge, to be from the accounts that have opportunities, because those are probably ones I'm working more um, uh, actively, and therefore the primary address and the primary contact and all that primary information will probably be more uh, accurate on an actively worked account. Okay. I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to say, let's do it with no filter, because I don't have a very big database, and say OK, and let's go ahead and run that, because we need to get some results. I can run it right now, or I can schedule to run it later when nobody's on the system. And now it's going out and looking at how many records are in A and B. It's building keys that it needs to do to, to do the fuzzy matching, and now it's actually doing the comparison. So at this point, I've, there's kind of four steps to using Paribus. One is setting it up. Two is running a match session, which is what I'm doing now. Three is reviewing the results. And four is processing those results. So I'm, at this point, done with running the comparison. It took 32 seconds to run through my 1,364 records. And every time you run a match session, you get this single page summary that kind of tells you what's going on, tells you when you ran it, how long it took. And how, this is where my eyes go immediately. How many groups did it find and how many members were in that group? In effect, I've got 4.6% of my account records look to be duplicated based on the criteria that I gave it of an 80% match on the account name and an 82% match on the full address. So then the next question is, OK, well, what did it find? Now I'm at the review point, the third step. So I can say, let's review the results. And this is where a person would step in and say, do I agree? Do I disagree? If I agree that these are actually duplicates, which one should be the primary? Now in this case, uh, let me talk a little bit about this review screen. This is the group of one vision accounts. There's three members in it. Here are those three members. Primary member always shows up here. And the duplicates I can select from to do a side-by-side -side comparison to the primary. And I won't spend a lot of time in here because I don't want to go over on time and I want to leave some time for questions. But in effect, basically, you say, I agree. Yes, merge them. If I look at these two and say, no, for whatever reason they shouldn't be, no, don't merge them. And you can do other things. You can put a question mark on it, and you can use shift clicks and put question marks on a bunch of things. You can close it, and you can come back later. You can pass it along. I say, Jenna, can you take a look at this test account match, uh, match session? I had some questions on some of them. Jenna can come in, and she can filter out the ones that she doesn't need to see and just deal with the ones that she needs to see and fix those and then come back, and I can come back, and it's all expanded out. Um, some other points here, the information in red is what Paribus compared on, so account name and address. But the information in blue here, anything in this area, are other informational columns that I specifically asked Paribus to 
present to the user who's doing the review. And this may this is all customizable in the data set definition. This may be custom things that are in your database, or maybe it's important for you to see the number of contacts, or who wrote the last history record, who's the account manager, who's the owner, uh, are there open opportunities, how many open opportunities. So there's all sorts of different things that you can have Paribus gather for you to make this easy for a reviewer to make a quick, intelligent, informed decision. Okay, Because this is where you make the decision of, are they duplicates or are they not? And if they are duplicates, which one should be the primary? Now, in the case of the sales logics merge function, when we merge these, when we take step four and actually merge these records, we will take every single thing from the duplicate and move it over to the primary. And by every, I mean every. I don't mean some. I don't mean we're going to miss stuff. And I don't mean we're going to throw anything away. We will keep everything. And that's, if you've ever merged two records in sales logics, you know that things get lost because the merge function in sales logic is very hard coded. It doesn't understand a lot of your custom stuff. It doesn't understand that if the phone number here is different than the phone number here, I might still want that one. Let's talk in some detail. Remember that JAE group that we saw? We had seven JAE accounts in sales logic. In this case, I'm only showing four. And the reason is because the address for these four is on Bollinger Canyon Road in San Ramon and the address for these three is on Market Street in San Francisco. So because I had a condition of address, it broke it up into two logical groups. Yes, I have seven in California that were our potential duplicates, but you told me to look at the address. So I'm giving it to you. Paribus is responding back and saying, I've got two groups, actually. One's in San Ramon, one's in San Francisco. Now, even though I said we can customize this to your heart's content, or heart content within SQL Server rules, to include other information, there may still not be enough information here. We have a little direct link to mouse clicks, and now Paribus just told SalesLogix, hey, create for me a dynamic group of just those four records so that I can look at all the detail. Okay. I've got, it looks like I'm at, at uh, 1246 here, so I've got about um, 14 minutes left. So I'm going I'm to speed up a little bit here. So let's say I wanted to merge these four. And here I'm trying to make the decision of which one should be the primary. Well, if I go here, this one's a customer. Five contacts. There's no history on this one. This one isn't the customer, so that's probably a duplicate. But there's information here that I want to push over, like the telescopes, or maybe somebody's still using it. New description. They're still entering in information here. This has a web address. Let's add a toll-free number. And this one's a prospect, so that wouldn't be the primary. There's some history and a couple of contacts there. And this one, let's put in a different 888 number. Okay. So if I, these are the four records that I want to merge, you could do it in sales logic. You could say, merge these records. And it would choose a primary. But if you were to merge those four like that, any of the different information like different phone numbers be thrown away from the duplicates. The fact that one was a customer and one was a prospect, the fact they were a prospect would be thrown away because there's no room in the type column in the account table to push another value. So what Paribus does is it will backfill as much as we can. So if this is my primary, you'll see there'll be a, a toll-free number and a web address and a division and a description coming over. The, all the contacts, those are one to many things. Those come in easily. All the history records will come in. But if you also merge these in sales logic, there'd be no record that there were ever four different accounts. There would just be one account that had a bunch of extra information and some stuff thrown away, but no record that they were ever separate. Well, we'll fix that, too. So let's go back to Paribus and say, I want to create. I want to say, this is the primary. Move that one in the primary position. These three are the duplicates. It checked it off. I'm going to go ahead. Now, typically, you wouldn't do a partial batch. You would, you know, approve or disapprove of all of them, but in the name of time, I'm just going to go ahead and log into my Paribus for Sales Logics um, plugin. It's doing a little quick analysis to say, hey, have I ever seen this database before? And if I have, has the structure of it changed? Because every database is different. So Paribus, the first time I ran this, ran through a little four-step wizard and built custom reassignment rules specifically for the structure. 
structure of my sales logic database. As you can see, there's some things in here that are custom tables at the account level. There's also custom tables at the contact level. It found those without me telling it to. So it will do a, a schema discovery of your database the first time you use it and find all the custom stuff that was added. And then you can say, okay, well, what do I want to do? I want to merge the accounts. Um, when I reassign contacts, I want to take care of that. Okay, that's all fine. So let's go ahead and add a cleansing session for that test account match. There's only two groups that I approved. So that's all that's going to merge. I want to merge the associated account records. I can choose to either keep or remove the duplicates. I want to create a history record. I don't have any synchronized remotes, so I don't need to synchronize changes out to the remotes. But if I did, it, that checkbox would create all the proper test files. You can either keep or remove. If I remove the duplicate, those three duplicate accounts would be completely removed. And that's OK for most people. But in this case, I'll show you what happens. We have the ability to keep the duplicates but hide them from everyone. So I'm going to go ahead and set up those rules and say I want to go ahead and run this session. Next, next. Yes, I, I've done my backups and all that. Are you sure? Yes, are you really sure? And now it's going to go through. And based on the structure of my sales logics database, it's going to merge those two groups of records and give me a summary report saying what did it do, what tables were affected, how many things. It will give me audit detail on what happened to those records, how many records were reassigned from each table, the fact that I said hide it so the set code ID was changed to Fugate Paribus, so now those hidden records wouldn't be seen by anyone. And where it really comes down to is what does it look like now in sales logics? And now, just doing a quick F5 refresh, the division came in, and the web address came in, and the toll-free number came in, and the new description I put in came in. And all of those other addresses are still there, but they're marked as being realigned by Paribus. And this is still the primary address. The primary contact for the account is still the primary contact for the account, but all the other contacts are brought in. I have all the history records that came in from the duplicates and one that Paribus wrote because I asked it to. This account was identified as the master in the cleansing process. Also, I have an audit that says, this is a tab that we've added in through a bundle, standard sales logic bundle, saying here's the three accounts that got merged in. And here is all the extra data, including the extra names that this account went by, extra fax numbers that we would have lost in a standard merge, extra main phone numbers and a toll-free number, that secondary toll-free number that I added back in, the fact that they were also a prospect. And this is not just data that's accessible, it's also usable. Maybe this com the company said, yeah, we're we don't want to be known by the Jupiter Astronomy Equipment Corporation anymore, kind of like KFC doesn't want to be known as Kentucky Fried Chicken. Yeah, let's go ahead and switch that and flop that name out so that now the account name is JE. So any of this information here can be replaced back into the main account information or wherever it resided in any one-to-one -one table or one-to-many table like that. Okay? So that's the kind of start to finish of Paribus going from having a bunch of duplicates in your system to having those duplicates consolidated into a logical uh, amalgam of all of the information, one-to-many, one-to-one, all of the stuff, building the best record possible but without losing anything. Okay? That was a very, very quick demo, but you get the idea. We can go into more detail on that. And also, let me throw this out. And maybe go back here to Paribus um, and show something. Remember when I ran this match session? We had a single page summary that showed how many records it found, what percentage. Let me offer this to anybody here who isn't already using Paribus of a free data analysis. Um, it takes less than an hour over a web session just like this. If you would like us to install Paribus on your system for free and set it up for using with sales logic or dynamic serum or sage serum or whatever database you have we can do it in under an hour and get do a sampling if your database is large we'd probably just do a sampling of a, a state or a region or something like that a few thousand records to kind of get an idea of how many duplicates you have in your system and what do they look like so you'll still be able to get a view of what Paribus finds for free, under an hour. I'll put that offer out. If you're interested in that, let Jenna know, and uh, she can let your account rep know. And they can get in contact with us, and, and we can do that free data analysis. Everybody who has data, typically, has duplicates. And 
whether it's a big problem or a small problem, Pyramus can help you size that problem and, again, help to get that ROI analysis going as to, you know, is this something we should pay more attention to? Should we invest in a tool and some processes to help alleviate that problem? Okay. So, uh, but we're going to get to Q&A here in a second, and, and if you have any questions, feel free to type them into the, the GoToMeeting um, uh, chat area, and we can get some answers out. But for more information, if you want to contact your technology advisor's representative about strategies, about our products, about other products that might help in improving the quality of your data, um, Conrad or, or any of the, the, your people at technology advisors can help you out with that. Um, there's more information at the technology advisor's website. There's also more information and flyers and things like that. Uh, video, uh, a recording of a demo kind of similar to this is up on the website as well. There's also a little flash thing on Paribus, um, or you can get in contact with me directly. So I'm going to kind of open it up here to see if there are questions that are popping up. Um, and Jenna, I don't know if you have, let's see here, if there's any questions. I don't see any on my screen, so I'll let you uh, speak up here. Um, so if there is no questions, I'd just like to thank you, Dale, for the great information and presentation. Um, and then thanks again for joining us, and we hope you can join us for um, the future webinars in this series. series. We have a couple coming up, um, e-marketing, July 28th, and then August 18th, we have change management. And then September 2nd, we have one on cloud computing. And you can register at our website, www.techadv.com, and there's a webinar um, button right there. Okay, so if we have no questions, Great. then uh, thanks again for joining us. And I'll, like, I'll add my thanks as well. Joe, thanks for putting this together and for all the attendees. We really appreciate your time. I know it's a, it's a busy and hard to get out of the day sometimes. Hopefully you had lunch at the same time. Um, Jen, you bought lunch for everybody, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, like I said, uh, let, me, let me switch back here. If you do have any questions, feel free to either contact technology advisors or contact, uh, contact me directly, and we'll be happy to help you out. All right. Thanks. All right, have thanks a great again. afternoon, everyone.